Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today for another class. We are going to continue on a topic that we began a few weeks ago entitled uh, No Compromise. And I encourage you, uh, this is the fifth part in that series, and if you have not uh, seen the other parts, I encourage you to go there first and listen to those, uh, parts one through four, because uh, I'm going to be teaching on a cure for no compromise here, kind of the conclusion to what we've talked about in the first, uh, in the first uh, uh, lessons. And I just think it's very important that you understand, so uh, those first parts are very important. So you can, like for me, I shared things that I could really relate to so that when I began to see the truth, that allowed the Spirit to make application to prevent myself from getting into compromise to start with. So to just know the answer at the end is not really as beneficial, although it's important because you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. But I believe the other is very important to make the application and you can see it uh, in your life. That's why God just didn't write uh, in his word, just 10 commandments and keep them or else. And then, you know, that was the end of the book. No, he explained and showed how to live in that word and, uh, you know, what happens when you don't follow it, what happens when you do follow it, you know, and uh, how to live it on a daily basis. And that's all included in the word of God. And it's beautiful. I love it. I uh, thank God that he's given us the word that he has. It is awesome. So in, uh, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. We're going to start there, but let me just give just a little bit of background here uh, to kind of catch us up to speed. Uh, I gave two examples, one about Lot and one about Job, and uh, one about uh, allowing the world into your life a little bit at a time, and the other was about allowing fear into your life a little bit at a time. And both of them ended up you know, it, with great loss and destruction in their lives. And uh, it didn't it just affect them, it affected those close to them as well. So it's very important what we're talking about here and uh, the importance of not compromising in any way whatsoever. So, you know, I laid out all those uh, how compromise works, uh, areas it affects us in, and, um, and today I want to talk about the deliverance that God has given to us uh, and made available to us so that we can walk free from compromise in our life. I think that's just beautiful that he's done that for us. He was the one that said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. So um, that's what we're going to see today, the truth that will make us free. So I wanted to start probably at the foundational level is that Compromise always begins with a thought. Yes, every time it starts with a thought. A thought that we receive from the enemy that uh, divides us or separates us uh, from what is actually true in our mind and our heart. Now, it may not be there yet. It might just be a truth in God's word that we don't know about, uh, but the enemy will bring it up and God is faithful as I shared last time that he will always show us the way of escape to that temptation. Again, compromise, uh, the thought that comes is uh, to compromise is a temptation. The enemy is baiting you out through a thought, an idea, uh, you know, however you want to say it, an imagination, you know, whatever words you want to use. He's drawing us out to agree with him for the purpose to allow him in in our uh, to allow him into our life where he can kill, steal, and destroy. I've made this point many, many, many times in many studies. But if the devil could just kill you right out, you'd already be dead. He can't do that. He doesn't have that ability or privilege. He needs you to destroy you. Okay, and that's why he starts with a thought, because the devil is a spirit. He can't just appear to you. He's a spirit. He has no physical shape, no uh, nothing. He's just an evil spirit. That's what the Bible calls him over and over. 
And so he has to, he, the, his only ability to communicate to you is spiritually. And how does he do that? Through thoughts. He communicates to us through thoughts. So let me read again the, the definition for compromise so that we can stay focused on what kind of thoughts he's going, what kind of thoughts we can cast down. So uh, compromise means to settle differences by each side making concessions. Uh, something that combines qualities of different things. Those are all uh, compromise. A weakening or relaxing or reduction of one's principles or standards. Okay. Oh, that's very good. Think about that. So compromise, that is what compromise is. So the enemy is constantly trying to get you. He pre like, let's take for example, how those thoughts uh, might come to us. He presents something like uh, you might see in the word, like let's say just prosperity. Oh, look at how prosperous uh, Abraham was. So the compromise in that thought is that he says to us, well, you need to be prosperous in, in order to be like Abraham. So he turns, the, he turns it around to where we think prosperity equals uh, Abraham. Instead of saying, wait a minute, Abraham was prosperous because of his heart towards God. Those, that prosperity came as a fruit. It was not the root uh, to his success and his uh, you know, notoriety in the scriptures, being the father of faith. So uh, the enemy takes one little thought like that and he twists it. In other words, he says, well, there's a difference between you and Abraham. Look how prosperous Abraham was. So he focuses on prosperity, and then he gets you to compromise or say, yeah, there, that's why he was so successful, was he was so wealthy. And then so it gets a person to begin focusing on that. Another area of compromise is... Uh, the enemy will get someone to say, uh, let's say through their, their hearing a testimony or someone sharing about how, boy, they changed their diet and now they feel so strong and they had all these aches and pains and, and now, uh, now they don't have those aches and pains anymore and they attribute it all to their diet. So the enemy gets us to compromise and instead of focusing on good health being a result of having faith or confidence or steadfastness in the finished work of Christ. Now they've mixed in, okay, remember what it says here? Uh, uh, mixing or combining qualities of different things. Now they've, they're mixing in, <clears throat> excuse me, now they're mixing in some of, uh, okay, Jesus plus this diet, this special diet, and then I'll be healthy, okay? so. That little compromise there begins with one little thought. They overhear something. They read an article. You know, however, that's how it worked with me. You know, when I was praying and commanding and rebuking and just getting sicker and sicker, the thought came to me and it came through my, my pastor. Well, you know, maybe what you have isn't sickness or disease. Maybe it's a nutritional issue. So, you know, God provided food. So go look and find out what kind of food cures what you got. And so that's what I did. I began to focus on the flesh instead of what God provided through the Spirit. Now that's what that's the that's always the avenue that the enemy is going to use is something in the flesh. He's going to paint a picture that it is important in order for you to be free or have success or be great spiritually. So he's going to add that to it. And by doing that, if we accept that thought, that is the beginning of compromise. And once you begin to compromise, it's going to lead to another compromise, to another compromise. And like I said before, pretty soon, like with fear, when you compromise with fear, pretty soon you become a very stupid person. Because now, instead of listening to the Spirit of God, you're allowing fear to be your object of worship. In other words, fear has become your God. It's dictating to you uh, and directing you what to do or not to do. And that all begins with compromise. 
and compromise begins with a thought. So I wanted to read this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Listen to what it says here. It says, uh, verse, um, oh, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to just start in verse 1. It says, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. So in other words, he again is showing how, he's pointing out the contrast here. Uh, that, hey, look, I, I don't, I, I look base, I look bad in, in, uh, in, you know, when you see me in the flesh. But when you listen to what I'm saying, it is bold. And uh, listen to what he says. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with you, when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Okay, now that's an important point that he's making here. He's saying, look, people are thinking that I am walking according to the flesh. But he said, uh, listen to what he says. For though we walk in the flesh, not according to the flesh, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And the war there is not just like fight, but the war is we're not... We're not engaged uh, in the flesh, okay? And, and the, the, uh, the, our engagement is not after the flesh, but it's after the Spirit. Listen to what he says. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, that's a parenthetical phrase. You could skip that out and you could leave that out for a second. He'd say, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And why? Because they cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and brings into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Okay, think about that for a second. That is the war that we have. See, the enemy, again... Our, our adversary is the devil. Very clear. Scripture makes it very clear in uh, Peter, 1 Peter 5. And the adversary, our devil, is walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And the only way we can resist him is being steadfast in the faith. Now remember, compromise causes you to relinquish some of your steadfastness or relax some of your steadfastness, or to let go of some of your standards or principles, have them withdraw the, the boundary on them a little bit. Now, it's very clear here that you cannot do that. Now, listen, if, well, you can, you're, you're free to do that, but if you do, Peter made it clear in 1 Peter that the enemy will take advantage of you when you do that. And this is what Paul is saying here. He's saying the weapons of our warfare are not in the flesh. So you can't use your flesh in any way to benefit yourself or to combat the devices of the enemy. You have to use the weapons that we have been given by God to do what? To pull down strongholds. See, the enemy is coming against you with his strength. And his strength is deceit. His strength is lies. His strength is making things appear uh, like they are of more value than what you have in Christ Jesus. Those are, those are his strengths. So if he can get us to buy into those, like, yeah, yeah, we need that, just like he did with Eve. Remember, he told Eve, he said, God's holding out on you. Man, he knows that if you eat of that tree, you're going to be just like him. You're going to have his knowledge and he's been holding out on you. What a lie that was. They had everything that God made them to be. God said he made them in his image. The only thing they didn't know was evil. And they didn't need to know evil. Okay, they didn't need to know evil like God knew evil. And so God said, hey, don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But what was the one that the enemy talked to them about? What tree did he pick to talk to them about? 
the one that they were free to eat of or the one that God said not to eat of? Boy, folks, that is very important for us to realize. See, the enemy's only going to be communicating to you about things that are not good for you, okay? But he's going to present them in such a way that they are good for you, okay? Like the world. Let's, I, we were talking about Lot in uh, a few lessons ago. Look at Lot. The enemy came to him with the world. Hey, you're missing out just living out in this tent out here. Man, they're having all the fun in the city. You got to go down to Sodom. Listen, to, look at how it's lit up all night and, and how they're all, you can just hear them all the way from, you know, as far away as they are. You can hear all the fun they're having. And you're out here all by yourself. It's quiet. Nothing's going on. You got to move into the city. That's where the life is happening. You know, however the enemy used it, he got him to move from a place of security to a place of insecurity where the minute he saw those angels walk through the door, uh, through the gate, he knew that they were different than the people in that town. And he recognized that they were innocent in the sense uh, compared to the rest of the people. And he pressed them not to dwell out in the streets. He knew what would happen to them. He said, look, you come into my home. I think you'll be safe there. And he found out that wasn't even true. Okay, they tried to get him there. And if it wouldn't have been for the angels, the power that they had, uh, they would have broke down the door of uh, Lot's house and got through to there. So think about this for a second. The enemy is only going to use things that are not good for you. That's what he's going to talk to you about. But he's going to present them in such a way that you feel like they're necessary or you can't do without them and be okay. And that's where the compromise comes in. And that's why here it says that, that uh, the weapons God's given us are even strong enough to pull down strongholds. They're greater than the greatest strongholds you can have. You know, I speak and minister to many people. And one of the big challenges with people uh, receiving healing is they won't let go of what they think is necessary to be well. And much of that includes diet, medicine, uh, doctors, uh, exercise. You know, they have all these other things that have been added to what they th have been added to their heart where they think without those things, they can't be well. And they'll, defa they'll default <laughs> to all that they've read or been told, but yet they have nothing from the scriptures that is uh, greater than the knowledge that they that's governing their heart and hindering them from receiving what's already been done for them. So they're like really opposing themselves in they're resisting what God has already provided for them in Christ because they've compromised. In other words, they've accepted this little idea that, oh, I need to have this so I can be healthy. You know, I need to have this medicine or I need to take this supplement or I need to eat this kind of food or I cannot eat that kind of food. And they have all these rules and regulations that have really uh, been mixed together and made their faith unstable to where they're not steadfast. And we're going to read about that in a second here. And it all begins with a thought. It all begins with them accepting a thought or an idea. And this is what God has told us to do. He said we're to cast down imaginations, okay, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What is a high thing? A high thing is anything that's, that we accept above the truthfulness of God's word that becomes lifted up above the Word of God. He says we're to cast that down. Cast it down to where? To its proper place, which is under our feet. The flesh is never going to be greater than the Spirit. The flesh is the limiting factor in our life. It's not the, the liberty that God's given us. The, the liberty He's given us, the freedom that we have, is in the Spirit. It's not in the flesh. 
So you can never be truly as free as you can be living after the flesh, only after the Spirit. So the enemy is trying to get us always through thoughts, ideas, compromise, to get, take in some of the flesh, compromise, exchange, let's read that again, where you combine qualities of different things or you each side making a concession. He wants to give us, the devil wants us to give up something that we have, steadfastness that we have in Christ for something that we, he's telling us is a strength we need in order to be uh, better, stronger, faster, healthier in the flesh. And that is not true. And if he can get you to bite on that, then that is a concession. That is a compromise. That is a weakening of your standards or principles. And what happens then? Well, then you're fair game. The enemy can kill, steal, and destroy at his will. And the, you're going to find it difficult to resist or to stand against him. But praise God. That's why I'm calling this the cure. God has given us the way of escape. And what is the way of escape? Let's compare what we're hearing in our mind with what the actual truth is. Like it says here, listen to this. I'm going to 1 John. 1 John. 1 John. Listen to what he says here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. It says, there is no fear in love. In other words, you won't find in love, you won't find any fear at all. There's no compromise with love there at all. Okay, you, you get that? They're both polar opposites. There is no fear in love. But, listen carefully, but, but perfect love is casteth out fear. So let's say you do have fear and you do have love inside of you. You're cooperating with one or the other. If you cooperate with the love, then there will be no more place for the fear. But if you cooperate with the fear, then you're going to have fear that's going to hinder the, the love from manifesting in your life. It's your choice which you're going to follow. He goes on to say, for he that uh, for because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. So when you accept a fear, it holds you back from what? It holds you back from being perfected in love. In other words, it hinders you from embracing the completeness that you have through the Spirit of God that's dwelling in you. Now that's what Job did. Job compromised. He accepted a little bit of fear and now his steadfastness on God being the one that was able to protect his children, his crops, his, his, his uh, animals, his people, all of his servants, uh, he gave that up for a fear. And now his steadfastness on that safety was gone. And the enemy was able to freely kill, steal, and destroy because the fear that he received brought down the hedge. We, brought, we uh, talked about that in the last example that we gave about compromise. So let's read, uh, go to 1 John chapter 2. This is again, this is a capturing thoughts. This is the point we're making where we talk about capturing thoughts. You know, it tells us here, listen carefully, it says in chapter 5, uh, verse 3, it says, it tells us that this is the love of God. Did you ever wonder what the love of God is? Well, this is the love of God, that we keep his word, and his word is not grievous. Okay, it says commandments here, but his word is a commandment. You can, it, if you go to the Old Testament in Proverbs, Psalms, it uh, explains, it, it, and, uh, it makes the word commandment, the word words, the word statutes, uh, and the word laws, it uses them all to, in the same exact meaning. So even though that gives us the freedom to be able to exchange the word commandment for word here. Now, the reason I do that is because many people, when they hear commandment, their mind just turns off. They stop listening because one of two things, either they're really heavily under condemnation or they've been... Uh, uh, they have a very legalistic mindset 
to where they think, you know, I get one more law I got to keep. I can't handle any more laws or any more commandments. Or they've been uh, abused by, uh, you know, legalistic people who are always preaching, you got to keep the commandments or God won't be happy with you. And so it shuts down their mind. They're not able to hear or receive. So I always, uh, you know, by permission of the Lord, I exchange, in many cases, I exchange the word, word for commandment because it's God's word and God's commandments are equal. They are the same. So this is the love of God, that we keep his word. And his word is not grievous. You know why it's not grievous? Because it's, it's life. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Wow, why wouldn't you want to walk in those? Listen to the fruit of that. And this is the point we're getting to because I talked about um, you know, the fear. I wanted to address this to where we could see the cure. And also just a side note, um, on my website, uh, there, there are a couple teachings where I specifically talk about fear. One is an audio video series that's entitled Freedom From Fear. Another is an article that I've written, and uh, that is called The End of Fear. Now, they're available for you to free. They're available for you uh, free. You can download the audio for free. You can also download the article, The End of Fear, for free. And I encourage you to, uh, to get those and to listen to them and, and uh, meditate in those truths because they're going to free you from compromise and they're going to free free you from the effects of that compromise in your life. So in 1 John chapter 2, listen carefully what it says. It says, um, he, let's see, where is it? Verse 5, it says, but whoso keepeth his word, his word, his commandments, his law, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Wow. So right here, it shows you that the cure for fear is just simply keeping God's word. So how does that work in light of of, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and in light of no compromise? Remember, the thought that's coming to you is trying to get you to compromise, to give up some of the truth, to give up some of the things of the spirit to engage in the flesh. Now, that's not going to be good for you at all. That's going to lead to your death, destruction, and loss, okay? Just so you know. But here he's telling us that perfect love casts out fear, 1 John 4, 18. So, but this says that the way you're perfected in love is by simply keeping the word. So how do you do that? Well, when the thought of the enemy comes to get you to compromise, you go back and see what does the word say about what I'm hearing from the enemy? And then we say, we're not giving up any of the word. We're not compromising any of the word at all to accept or cooperate with this idea that the enemy's bringing to me. I don't care how good it looks, what the enemy's telling me, it'll add unto me. Nope, I'm rejecting it right now. Again, an application of that. Uh, You know, you're on a trip somewhere and you've forgotten to bring your certain supplement that you need, that without that you feel sick or you get sick or something bad happens, and you realize when you're unpacking, oh, no, I left it on the kitchen counter. What do you do? Well, the enemy says you need to go right away uh, to get uh, to Whole Foods or to you know natural grocers or whatever your favorite health food store is, and you got to buy some of that. And how do you get into compromise? Well, instead of saying, no, it is written. I don't have to be afraid. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Uh, Instead of you responding like that, the enemy's throwing thoughts at you and telling you, well, you, you can just Google it. It'll show you where it is. There's one close by, I'm sure. And all those thoughts are leading you to compromise. And what are you going to do? Are you going to take a stand? Well, if you've been letting that govern your life, chances are you've been weakened because of that compromise. And your steadfastness 
is now not steadfast on what God said, that you're complete in Christ Jesus, that you are healed by the stripes of Jesus. No, you're thinking you're healed by the stripes of Jesus. That is true. But you're thinking that the stripes of Jesus made it possible for you to be able to find out and to buy and to take this certain supplement. Now, all of that is fear-driven, but it starts with a thought that you need this. Now, yes, does that supplement you're taking actually provide a physical uh, reaction in your body that you find to be, uh, you know, uh, good for you or better for you than not taking it? Well, it could, but you shouldn't let your heart be connected to it because the minute you compromise and say, I need that too, then the enemy has a place in your life. And that place that he has is to little by little kill, steal, and destroy. Just like it did with Job. Just like it did with Lot. Oh, what's, I don't, you know, what's a little, you know, how's it going to hurt just looking down there? How's it going to hurt just going out to dinner? This guy buys a lot of my sheep. I'll just go to town with him and we'll have, you know, dinner together. Well, what does the guy introduce at dinner together? Well, all sorts of uh, lewd and crude and things that Lot had never been exposed to, as it says in, uh, in Peter, uh, with their unlawful deeds. To that, you know, he's just going to have dinner with somebody that buys a lot of his sheep, uh, but now he sees what this guy believes because now he's being exposed to his unlawful deeds, and he's partaking of them by not taking a stand against them. You know what I mean? He said, fine, I'll sell you sheep, but I'm not going to partake of your sin. I'm not going to be part of your life. You know, Jesus had dinner all the time with scribes and Pharisees that were sinners, but he told them the truth while he enjoyed their good food. And uh, he didn't compromise. He came for a purpose, and that purpose was to to preach the gospel, the good news, to all that he would come into contact with. And he didn't compromise it for anything. And look at what he was able to do. His steadfastness led him to take our sins upon himself and to suffer in our place in hell so that we could be set free. And that's all a result of his no compromise of him being steadfast. And he had this testimony that he pleased God. Amen? Remember what God spoke over him twice? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. That is so important. Think about that. Who I am well pleased. That meant Jesus was walking by faith because without faith, steadfastness, it's impossible to please God. So Jesus lived and walked by faith without compromise. Remember, it says here, a weakening of one's steadfastness, one's principles, or one's standards. Okay, that's what compromise is. So if you're weak in faith, somewhere along the way, there's been a compromise in your life. And that compromise is a result of what? A started with a thought. You had to agree with a thought from the enemy that he brought to you that is now death, destruction, and loss in your life. But folks, even if we get involved, like I was reading here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, even if you get involved with with something that becomes a stronghold of compromise in your life, we have a word from God that will pull down that stronghold. And the way we pull down that stronghold is we begin stopping our compromise. In other words, We take back the land that we have conceded or made concessions to the enemy with. You don't have to buy it back because it belongs to you in Christ. You just have to take it now. Remember what he told Joshua? That he first told to Moses? He said, every place that the sole of your foot treads, that shall be your land. But your foot has to tread on it. That's when it becomes yours. See, the enemy through compromise is squatting on your land. It's still not his land. It belongs to you. But him squatting on your land does what? Well, 
Him squatting on your land gives him opportunity to kill, steal, and destroy in your life. In other words, he's moved in. And that's exactly instead of that's exactly the opposite of what happened with Lot. See, he moved in to where the enemy was. And he dwelt with the enemy. Instead of him saying, no, I might have to go there because it's part of the world to you know, make my sales or whatever, but I am not going to partake of their evil. Amen? And uh, that's, that's what we have to avoid. And it's, it all begins with us, with this, us bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We have to be steadfast on what God says. Now you say, well, I've been compromising my whole life. I, I find myself being very weak and, and uh, not being steadfast and wishy-washy. I'm always fighting with unbelief and thoughts of this and thoughts of that. And so how do I overcome that? You know, well, it starts one thought at a time. We have to begin to take each thought that's contrary to the word of God and begin to shore up our steadfastness again by not compromising. In other words, every time, no matter how much you've given in to something in the past, you can stop at any point and you can begin to esteem the word as being greater. Now, where does that strength come from? It comes from relying on the Spirit of God that's in us. The Spirit of God is our strength and us resting in His ability over our ability. So don't let your recovering out of your, your hand, recovering yourself out of the snare of the devil be the burden that you're bearing, but rather say, wait a minute, Jesus died and, and, uh, and provided a way of escape even for someone who is, you know, into the, up over their eyeballs in sin. So surely I can be set free by relying on the work that he's already accomplished for me. And the way I'm going to uh, let that work in my life is to honor that. I'm going to put that before everything else in my life. So when those thoughts come, I'm going to say, no, I choose what Jesus has already done for me. And here's what it says he's done for me. So we're not working it out for ourselves. We're not accomplishing it ourselves. No, we're just resting in the victory that Christ already gave us through what he has done and our steadfastness. Again, it's our faith that appropriates what he has done. We're not compromising our faith. No, not even a little bit. In other words, we're saying, no, I'm not giving in an inch. Okay. Listen to this scripture. It's a good example in both cases. Uh, the examples I brought up of what we have the capacity to do through Christ and just saying no, just saying no to compromise, just remaining steadfast on what Christ has done in our life and not giving in or conceding a little bit, even to that little symptom that's bugging you and pounding on your door. You say, you know what? I've already defeated that in Christ Jesus. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to uh, accept it. I'm not going to just ignore it. I'm going to address it. And I'm going to say, symptom in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you loose me now. And then walk on. Just move on. Don't let it be part of your life anymore. Don't magnify it. Don't, as we just read, don't that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, don't let it go there anymore. Keep it under your feet. Each time it rises up, say, no, you were defeated in Christ Jesus, and I'm resting in what he's already accomplished. It's mine. I'm not going to get into an argument because that argument or debate is opportunity for the enemy to, to convince you that you are missing something, that it's really not yours yet, you're waiting on the manifestation. When the manifestation happens, then you'll get it. No, that's all a lie from the enemy. You've already got everything that God has done for you in Christ Jesus. Listen to this verse, these verses here. I'm in Psalms 112. Listen to, listen to what it says here. I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, Praise ye 
the Lord or praise Jehovah. Blessed is the man that feareth Jehovah, that, de- that delighteth greatly in his commandments. Not just a little bit, like, oh, you know, I like that one about thou shalt not commit adultery or thou shalt not murder because then nobody can kill me without sinning. No, it's you greatly delight in all the word of God because all the word of God is what? It's spirit and life, it's truth. The thing that makes us free. It's awesome. It says, um, his seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house and his righteousness endureth forever. You know, when you're walking after the word and you're greatly delighting in the word of God, then the fruit of that is no compromise. You're not going to be allowing anything in to rob you of the benefits that you have in Christ Jesus. You're not going to be exchanging or bartering them for anything of this world that just fades away. It passes away. Listen to this. It says, um, uh, a good man showeth favor and lendeth, verse 5, he will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in Jehovah, our Father. Listen, what is it? What is it that is causing him to not be afraid of evil tidings? Well, it says right here, his heart is established. He shall not be afraid. Why is his heart established? He's trusting the Lord. How do you trust the Lord? You put your confidence that what his word said is is true in your case, and you don't compromise. You don't move an inch off that word, not a half inch, not a millimeter, not a 32nd, not a 64th, though not a hundredth of it. You don't budge at all. You say, no, it is written. And we talked about this before. Jesus is an awesome example of what that looks like. He rested in the word that his father taught him when the enemy challenged him in the wilderness, okay? He realized that it wasn't a full belly that would cause him to be at rest or at peace or that would prove that he was the son of God, but rather it was what the word said about him and that word is what he chose to live by and be sustained by in his life. Jesus is an awesome example of that. But notice here, his heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. In other words, there's no compromise at all, none whatsoever in this man. Because his, and what does it also say? His heart is established. It's established in what? The truth of God's word, in the righteousness that he has received from God. That is just, that's just awesome. Now, the opposite of that is what we talked about. Listen to this. This is an example of compromise. In 1 John chapter 2, John's talking about the same thing. We spoke a little bit about this in, earlier uh, when he said that, you know, look, I'm coming and I'm sharing the light of God. And he said, there is no darkness in God at all. Either you're in the light or you're in the darkness. You can't mix the two together, okay? He goes on in chapter 2, and he says this. He says, um, verse, uh, verse 15, he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, The lust of the flesh, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now listen carefully. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You know what doing the will of God is? It's keeping his word. When you keep the word, it casts out fear. It pulls down strongholds. That's what keeping the word does. Is that grievous? Is that hard to be free and to remain free? No, it's the smartest, the most logical thing that someone who has that knowledge should be doing. Amen? 
That's what we should be choosing. But he says, don't love the world. We talked about this too. You can't, you can't serve God and mammon at the same time. You'll switch back and forth, but having that little bit of mammon is going to keep your heart divided, and that divided heart makes you unstable, and when you're unstable, you're not able to receive what God has provided for you in Christ. That's why you don't want to compromise. You don't want anything that the enemy's bringing you. You don't want any of the world to get into your heart. You don't want any of the world to get into your mind where you're looking at the things of God and the things in the world through the world's eyes. Because the moment you do, that has, first of all, it got there because of compromise. And second of all, it's going to lead to more and more and more compromise. Just take a look around you. Look in the world. I I mean, I gave an example of Lot, how he got into Sodom, and we talked a little bit about, you know, about how Sodom got to be as wicked as they were. You know, abundance of idleness. Uh, You know, they had a lot of free time on their hands. Uh, They were were prideful. They were full. They had all they needed. You know, they could go out and buy anything, you know, and eat anything. They were, their bellies were full. And, uh, and they weren't interested in helping anyone else. They were self-centered. Boy, that just describes the world today. But look at how this world, they brought one evil thing in, and once they get that one evil thing in, then they, then they say, oh, we need to legislate this evil thing, and then this evil thing, and it's one compromise after another until what? Till evil is ruling and reigning in the world. And that's why the Lord said, don't have any part of it. You know, we need to take a stand and be so steadfast that we don't allow any, not even a little bit, into it. It's like I get, you know, I was sharing this message at a church and this thought came into my mind. So it's, you know, it makes the point. But I said, how many of you out there love chocolate cake? And I think every hand went up. And uh, then I said, what if I put just a little bit of poop in your chocolate cake? You won't even taste it, okay? But just a little bit. You won't even know it's in there. And, you know, nobody would want to have that, okay? Think about the world as a little poop in your chocolate cake. You wouldn't want it that way. You don't want to have any part of it. Why? Because it takes away from the goodness of it. Just the thought of it reviles us. That's what we should think about the world. We should think, I don't want any of that at all in this life that I have in Christ Jesus. None whatsoever, because it's going to take away the goodness that I do have. Folks, that is just so important that we get that attitude. Speaking of attitude, listen to this. I love this attitude of David. And this attitude, folks, is what we have in Christ Jesus. I think it's, let me, on the way there, I'll go to Proverbs. I think Proverbs, I think it's 28. Listen to what it says here. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Think about that. You know, lions, they're not afraid of anything. You know, they're just, uh, you know, they're just like, you know, who are you? They don't run for anything except for their next meal. (laughs) Then they'll run for that. But they're picking and choosing. And we have that same boldness. We're as bold as a lion. But listen to this first part. The wicked flee when no man pursue it. Are you running from something? Do you feel like you have to have this, this, or this, or you're not going to be okay? Do you feel like you got to go take care of this? If you don't, you're not going to be okay. Why are you running? There's no one pursuing you. You have the victory. God has given it to you in Christ Jesus. What are you running for? Stop. Turn around. That's the devil that's chasing you. And how's he chasing you? With thoughts. Thoughts that you've compromised with. Turn around and say no. You know, just flip off that devil and say, get out of here now in Jesus' name. Turn around. 
Remember that you are as bold as a lion. You don't have to take that anymore. Say no now. Don't wait another second. Say no now. Stop the compromise in its tracks. Get this attitude that we see in David. Go with me to 2 Samuel. This is awesome. 2 Samuel 22. Listen to how, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I encourage you to read the whole thing because it is powerful. Oh, let's see, where will I start here? Um, wow. It's so good, I don't know where to start. I'll just jump into the middle, just for sake of time. I'm going to start in verse 29. This is David, and he says, For thou art my lamp, O Jehovah, Lord, and the and Jehovah will lighten my darkness. What were we just reading in uh, uh, earlier in uh, John? He said, there is no darkness in God at all. There's no compromise in God at all. There's only light. And when we let him, he'll be our light to the lighten the darkness of this world, if we'll receive it. Amen? And listen to what he says. He says, for by thee I have run through a troop. By my God, I have leaped over a wall. See, that's, we should have that same attitude. It's by God that I'm going to do that. By God, I'm going to succeed. By God, I'm going to cancel that lie. By God, I'm victorious. By God, my, str- my uh, sickness was healed. Amen? That's the attitude that we should have. Not what do I need to do or what do I need to take. That's all compromise, folks. Listen to what he goes on to say. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. See, this goes back to the word. David was focused on that word. What word was he focused on? That the Lord is the strength of his life. That he, God, is his light and his salvation. That he is abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. That he is saying of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. In him will I trust. His word is my shield and buckler. That's the attitude that he had received from listening and fellowshipping and uh, and just being in the word and keeping the commandments, keeping the word walking in the light. That's all saying the same thing. Listen to what he says. He says, who is God save Jehovah? And who is a rock save our God? God is my strength and power. He maketh my way perfect. See, this isn't, this isn't putting the burden on me. When you're capturing thoughts, the burden isn't on you. If it is, then you're performing to get that to happen. But leave the burden on the Lord and say, look, it's your word. I'm just resting in what you said. And that is my strength. That is my light. That is my salvation. That is my shield. I'm just resting in what your word says. How do you rest in it? You just simply believe it. And you don't move off of it. You don't compromise it. You don't accept anything your body's telling you what the enemy is telling you about your body, what your enemy is telling you about anything. You say, no, no compromise. That's my motto, no compromise. Verse 34, he maketh my feet like hinds feet. He setteth me on high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. A bow of steel. He said broken. You know how hard it is to break steel? And he said, it's broken by my arms. Why? Because he's put his confidence in God. He has let the word of God be his shield and buckler. We can do the same. But we can't compromise. You can't break a bow in half if you, you know, you're right here and then you quit. No, you got to go all the way. And that's what you and I have the capacity to do through faith in the word of God we can have that victory every time, not just once in a while, not just when we feel better, but now. Now is the day of, now is the time of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Right now. Listen to what he goes on to say. 
Um, uh, verse 36, thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation and thy gentleness has made me great. Not his strength, his physical power or whatever. No, the gentleness of the Lord. It's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance, a change of mind. That's the gentleness that we have in the Spirit of Christ. We could say it's the grace of God that has made us great. How are we great? We're great because we are seated next to God in Christ Jesus. That's where our greatness is, in the status that he has given us in Christ Jesus. Wow. He says, Thou hast enlarged my steps under me so that my feet did not slip. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them and turned not again until I had consumed them. Have you resisted the enemy and you've gotten some progress in your life and now you've just like, ah, and you've yielded to it again? No, don't do that. Listen to what David said. He said, I pursued my enemy and destroyed them and turned not again until I had consumed them. Don't let go of the word of God for anything. No compromise is what he was saying here, and turn not again until I had consumed them. In other words, I'm not, I'm not gonna stop wailing on the devil till he, there's not a breath left in him. You know, that's just a figure of speech. What I'm saying is I'm gonna resist the enemy because I already have the victory over him. I'm not trying to get it, but by not resisting him, I'm surrendering the victory that I do have to him. And folks, we do not want to go there. Amen? That is not a good place. Listen to what he says. He says in verse um, 39, I have consumed them and wounded them that they could not arise. Yea, they are fallen under my feet. Are you treading on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy? Or are you letting him beat up on you? See, you have the power and authority, but it's subject to your will. Have you compromised to where you feel like, you know, you're the doormat for the devil? No. If you have, I'm encouraging you to stand up. The boldness God has given you has not been diminished. It's just you've allowed other things to be greater in your mind and heart than what God says about you. So turn that around. Be like David here and say, I'm not quitting till, the, till there's not an ounce of that left in my life. I'm not giving up another second of my life to the enemy. You know, that's the beginning of no compromise. And then stick with it. The strength of the Lord is there to empower you. Like he told Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient for you because even when you are at your weakest point, that's when you're really your strongest because you're not relying on your flesh. You're relying on the strength that I have given you in Christ Jesus. And that's where your victory is. That's where you have success. That's where you have prosperity. Not going to get it. It's already yours in Christ Jesus. Wow, folks, this is awesome. Listen to what he goes on to say. He says, uh, for they are fallen under my feet. For Verse 40, for thou hast girded me with strength to battle. Them that rose up against me, thou hast subdued under me. How did he do that? For us, through Christ Jesus. Jesus defeated all the power of the enemy. As it says in Colossians, that we have triumphed over him. Amen? And uh, we have the victory in Christ because of what Christ did. He conquered the enemy and triumphed over him. And uh, listen to what it says here. He says, Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. You know, the devil hates you. And every thought that he's bringing to you is a manifestation of his hate. But it is often a deceiving thought to lead you to a place 
where you think, oh, well, this is good for me, but it's really inspired by the hate that the enemy has for you. He despises us. Amen? He goes on to say, he says, uh, verse 43, he says, Then did I beat them as small as the dust of the earth. I did stamp them as the mire of the street and did spread them abroad. Wow. See, that's how adamant we should be. You know, we started this off talking about uh, that, uh, you know, it says that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, uh, Matthew chapter 11. The kingdom of heaven suffereth, it suffereth violence, but the violent take it by force. See, that's what we've been talking about. The violent when, that take by force, there's no compromise in them whatsoever. This is a demonstration here of the violent taking it by force. They're not allowing any compromise into their life at all to where the, the, uh, they can't take what has been given to them in Christ Jesus. And that's what we are doing. We're not trying to get a victory. We're not going to give up any of the victory we have. But we have an adversary who is against us and trying to rob us from that. So we can't compromise in any way. We need to be as that violent that taketh by force. You know, he said here, he said, then did I beat them small as the dust of the earth. Do you remember? Here's a good example of, uh, of what the violent that take it by force look like. Do you know that when Moses came down off of the mount and he found the children of Israel worshiping this golden calf, do you know what he did with that calf? He took it and he beat it down to dust. Think about gold, getting gold down to dust. That took a lot of effort, but he got it down to dust. And he, that's the, that was the indignation and the violence in him where he said, this is not going to be part of our life here in the wilderness. And he took that and he he scattered that dust upon the water. He made them partake of that, uh, you know, of their drinking water. He's saying, look, this is beneath us. This is not part of us. It's going to go in us and out the draught where it belongs. Amen? Wow, this is, this is awesome stuff. And so, you know, like I said at the very first study that we're going to be talking about the violent take it by force, but the violent that take it by force are not compromisers. They are as bold as a lion. They're like David wrote here. There's many other places we could go, but I think you're getting the, the uh, I think I'm communicating the point that was on my heart was that violent that take it by force, there's no compromise in them. They don't allow the world in them. They don't allow fear in them. They don't allow anything that is not, that is of the devil in them. Not even a little bit. Yeah, no, not even in their chocolate cake. They won't accept any of that whatsoever. And that's the attitude that we have and that we saw demonstrated in Christ Jesus. You know, Jesus, when he went to that temple, there was no compromise in him. He, when he knew, he knew what he was about to do. And when he was there, he was determined. And even though he was far outnumbered, uh, you know, according to the flesh, he was still greater in number by the Spirit of God than anything they could have done to resist what he was doing and driving them out and throwing over their tables. See, they were powerless. And folks, when we have that same attitude, that same attitude of, no, I'm not giving in an inch. No, I'm not surrendering anything. And we will not compromise. You know, that's the strength that we'll have where the enemy will flee from us and not us fleeing from him. Well, folks, that's, uh, I think that wraps it up for us. And uh, thank you so much for joining me again I want to encourage you, if you did not catch these first, the it's a five-part series, so I encourage you to go back and to listen to all parts in this series because there's so many good points from the Word of God that will make all these dots fit together and make that perfectly straight line that we can walk in His light and walk on His path. Amen? So thank you again for joining me. 
You can catch all these at mycashministries.com. Please go there. There's many other uh, great teachings there and uh, good articles that will bless you and help you to uh, live a life of no compromise. God bless you.